Hey friends, I'm Miss Katsi, and I'm really excited to walk through this baptism class with you. So hopefully by now, you have downloaded our Community Kids Baptism Workbook. Looks like this. And parents, while we're walking through this class, I want you to go ahead and hold on to that notebook and jot down any um, ideas or visuals that I talk about, fill in the blanks. I want you to take the notes. That way your child can fully focus on the class, okay? So during this class, I hope to help simplify what it means to be saved and how baptism has a part in that. And this is really just to help you, the parent, start that conversation with your child. So you know your child best and so after this class you guys can continue to have conversations about their salvation and baptism and I'm just here to help simplify that for you guys okay so let's get started at the beginning and I don't mean the beginning of your book I mean the beginning of creation and so in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth we know that right and he created Adam and Eve. Those were the first two people that God created. And he created them and loved them. And what is amazing and I just get so excited about is to imagine the fact that God was actually with Adam and Eve in the garden. The Bible says so. And just a reminder, the Bible is God's word. It is God's word. It's kind of like a letter that he wrote to us. It is kind of like a manual, a, a hand, you know, written manual given to us so we know how to live our life and what, what it means to follow Jesus. And so in the Bible, you know, it says that God was with Adam and Eve in the garden and he walked with them. He was in their presence. And that is amazing. And unfortunately, you know, something happened. So because God loved Adam and Eve so much, he gave them some rules. And one of the rules was to not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. And he did that because he loved them and he wanted to protect them. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve broke that rule. And because they broke that rule, sin entered into the world. And unfortunately, sin separates us from God. So Adam and Eve actually had to get kicked out of the garden. God is perfect and he cannot be where there's sin. And so he had to separate himself from sin. And that made God very, very sad. And unfortunately, Adam and Eve are not the only people that have sinned. We all sin. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Boys and girls, that means everybody. That means me. That means your parents. That means you. We have all fallen short of God's glory. <sighs> very sad. And that made God very sad because he created us to have a relationship with him. And so let's jump into Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, when you sin, you pay, the pay you get is death. And in another translation, it says, the wages of sin is death. And I don't know if you guys know what wages are, but a wage is actually something that it's money that you, that you earn or deserve when you go to work. So your parents, they go to work, they work hard and they deserve the money that they get. Okay. So what this verse is telling us, what Paul is telling us in this verse is that what we deserve for sinning is death. And that sounds scary. But what it means is to be separated from God for eternity. But there's some good news. So let's go, let's go back to Adam and Eve, right? So Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and they were separated from God. So they were separated from God and we're separated from God because of our sin. So this image that's on the screen right now, you'll see kind of it, us being separated from God in the representation of two cliffs. So we're on one cliff and God's on the other cliff. And there's this big gap in the middle, right? And what separates us is sin. So sin is what separates us. And when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God, that made God very sad. And so he actually had a plan. He had a plan for us to be able to be reunited with him in a relationship with him like he wanted from the very beginning. And so the second part of that Romans 6, 23 verse says, the first part says the wages of sin is death. But the second part, that's the good news, boys and girls. The second part says the gift of eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. So that 
probably doesn't make sense yet, but that's okay. So because of what Jesus did on the cross is how we can have a forever friendship with God just like he intended, okay? So back to Adam and Eve, they sinned, they got thrown out of the garden and that made God very sad, but all throughout the Old Testament of the Bible, we see that God keeps promising his people, the Israelites, that he is going to send someone to save them. He's going to send a savior, the Messiah. Messiah means the promised one. Savior means someone who saves. Get it? Savior. So God was promising to his people that he was going to send someone to save them from their sins so God can be reunited in a forever friendship with his people, with us, with you, with me. That's what he wanted all along. And so all throughout the Old Testament, we see this promise coming, you know, God saying, hey, I'm gonna send someone to save you. And the Israelites, you know, try and do things on their own and, and they listen to God and then they don't listen to God. But then we fast forward to the New Testament. And boys and girls, those first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the gospels. And those are the books of the Bible that talk all about what Jesus did and why he came here on this earth and why he was so important and part of God's salvation plan. So Jesus is God's son, God's son in the flesh here on this earth. And his whole purpose was to save us. So out of God's amazing love, he decided to send his very son, his one and only son to come to this world, to live a perfect life. Remember, God is perfect and we're not. So he lived a perfect life. That means he did not sin. And while he was here on this earth, he was going around and teaching people about God's love. He was teaching them about God's plan and how God was going to save them and about God's kingdom in heaven. And unfortunately, there were some religious teachers that didn't like Jesus. They didn't believe what he was saying was true. They thought he was going to change the way they did church. And they, they didn't like that. And so eventually, you know, they got Jesus crucified on the cross. But what they didn't know was that was all part of God's plan. So what Jesus did on the cross was actually what saves us from our sins. Okay? So when Jesus died on that cross, he actually died and took the punishment for our sins. So remember what are what the wages of sin is? It's death, right? What we earn, what we deserve for sinning is to be separated from God. So because Jesus was perfect and he did not sin, he was able to take our punishment for us on the cross. That might sound still a little confusing. I know it's really hard to understand, but I have an example for you, okay? So think in your mind, hopefully you have a brother or a sister or maybe a cousin or a friend. So think about your brother or sister and imagine you guys are in the living room and your sister asks your mom or your dad, hey, can I borrow your phone? And mom and dad say, nope, you can't use the phone. You have to go finish your schoolwork. So mom and dad kind of walk away. They end up leaving their phone, you know, on the, on the dining room table or on the, on the living room table and you see your sister or your brother sneak over and grab the phone. And then they sneak away with the phone. And not only did they just break mom's rule from, for not, like, for they disobeyed mom's rule on, on grabbing that phone and taking it without permission, they ended up dropping the phone and it broke. So now they're in big trouble. Okay, parents watching. You find this out. You find out that your child took your phone and broke it. They disobeyed you. Oh my goodness. So. What, what would your punishment be for your child? Yeah, I thought so. So yeah, it would probably be like no technology for a whole month. And on top of that, they have to go and do all these chores to try and earn some money for the phone that they broke. So that seems like a fair punishment, right? Okay, so remember that was your brother or sister that did that? Now imagine you went to mom and dad and said, Hey, mom, dad, I know that my sister, you know, my brother broke the phone and I had nothing to do with it. I saw it all happen, but I didn't do anything. But I love my brother or my sister so much that I'm going to take the punishment for them. So I'm the one that's going to go without technology. I'm the one that's going to do all the chores. <laughs> that sounds so silly, right? Why in the whole wide world would you take a punishment for something you didn't do? But think about it. 
That's what Jesus did for us, right? He lived a perfect life. He did not do anything to deserve to die on that cross and to be separated from God. But he did that because he loves you. He did that because he wanted you to have that forever friendship with God that God promised. Because someone has to pay for the sins, right? Somebody has to pay for the punishment. And God didn't want it to be us, so he sent his son Jesus. There's a verse in the Bible, and I'm pretty sure you guys know this. So if you know it, say it with me. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah, that's amazing, right? So let's go back to that image that we were talking about before. So you're on one side of the cliff and God's on the other side of the cliff, right? So you're separated from God because of your sin. But what saves you and what allows you to have that forever friendship with God is what Jesus did on the cross. So you see how that cross connects the two cliffs together? Yeah, that is the only way we can actually have that forever friendship with God like he promised. Boys and girls, there is nothing that you can do to try and, and have that forever friendship with God. Like, you can't tell me, Miss Kati, I'm going to be the best kid ever. I'm never going to break any rules. I'm going to do my very best. Like, it doesn't matter how much good you try to do. You can't try and fix that broken relationship with God. The only way that that's possible is because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. Oh, wow, so that is, that's mind blowing, right? So what are you supposed to do with all this information? Now that you know, like, okay, Jesus is God's son. He came to die on the cross for my sins because of what he did on the cross is what helps me get my relationship fixed with God so I can have that forever friendship with God like he promised. So, so now what? So first what you have to do is you have to admit. You have to admit that you're a sinner. Okay, remember all have fallen short of the glory of God, everybody. So that means you, me, all of us. So we have to admit that we are sinners, that you are a sinner. And once you admit that you're a sinner, then you have to repent. Now that sounds like a fancy word, but really what it means is to stop the way you're going and turn around and go the other way, okay? So imagine, you know, I'm walking this way and I'm going the wrong way. I realize I'm going the wrong way. So I turn and I go the right way, okay? So repent just means to stop the direction you're going and then turn and go the right direction. So we have to admit that we're sinners and we need someone to save us and, and we need to, to repent, you know, that, that we need to go the direction that God wants us to go and live the way he wants us to live. So after we do that, then we believe. We believe that Jesus is the only one who can save us. We believe that he is the only way we can have that forever friendship with God in heaven forever, okay? So believe, believe. Hmm. I have a way to help you understand what it means to believe and trust, okay? So I have this chair over here. See? Chair! And I want to sit on this chair. So I'm going to sit on it. So I sat on it. I trusted, I believed that this chair was going to hold me up. All other chairs have held me up. Why wouldn't this one? Um... So I trusted that the, that the chair would hold me up, right? But that is kind of like, like what, how we put our trust in Jesus. So when we believe that Jesus is the one who saves us, we kind of put our, our whole trust, our weight, like, okay, Jesus, you got me. I believe you. I believe that you're the one who saved me. You trust what Jesus did for you. Okay, so now when you see a chair, you're going to think about believing in Jesus. <laughs> so anyways, so it means, you know, when you trust Jesus, you're putting your hope in him. Okay, so let's recap. First, you admit you're a sinner and you need to be saved and you repent. Then you believe that Jesus is the one who saves you. And then you confess it. You say it. You, you say it out loud. Okay, so when Jesus was here on this earth, he actually, you know, a few, few days before he died on the cross, he was with his disciples. And at this point, you know, Jesus was very popular. So he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And some of them were saying like, oh, well, these people over here, they think you're a really good teacher. And these people over here think you're, you're a prophet. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? You know, so Jesus is going to ask you. You have to make the decision. Who do you say that Jesus is? Not your parents, not me, not the people at church, but who do you say Jesus is? And so Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, 
spoke up and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that is the exact same thing that we say now when we confess and we proclaim and we say that Jesus is our Lord and our savior. Right? So remember, like he's, you're proclaiming, okay, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the one that God promised. You're the one who saves me from my sins. You're my Lord. Lord is, is someone, you know, is like a king, reigns over your life, right? So when you confess it, you say those things out loud and you're putting your belief in Jesus. And then finally, you commit your life to Jesus and follow his example by being baptized. Okay, so you repent, you believe, you confess, and then you commit your life to Christ through baptism. And Jesus himself was baptized, so we follow his example. And baptism is this picture of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. So imagine this with me. You know, if you're standing in the water, you're standing upright, just like Jesus was up on the cross. And then when you go under the water, you are, you know, you hold your breath for just a second and it's representing and it's a picture of Jesus in the tomb. And then when you come up out of the water, you come up with new life, just like Jesus rose from the grave. And boys and girls, there's nothing special about the water. You don't start over at age zero. That's not what I mean by new life. I just mean you come up, it's a representation of God washing away your sins and you choosing to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. So Ms. Kati, that means I'm never going to sin again, right? No, boys and girls, that's not what that means. That means you're going to live your life trying to follow God. And there are going to be times where you mess up because again, we're not, we're sinners. Just because we were baptized, it doesn't mean we're perfect now, but we're trying to live the life that God has called us to live. And the really cool thing is that God knew that this was gonna be hard, and so he gave you a helper. He gave you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God living in you. Now it's not this like little person that's inside of you, but it's God like, you know when you get that feeling that you did something wrong in the pit of your stomach? Yeah, that's kind of like, that's conviction. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you weren't doing what God has called you to do and what he wants you to do. And so in those moments, you stop, you repent, you ask God for forgiveness and, and the Holy Spirit will help you continue to do the right thing, right? So the Holy Spirit guides you. It reminds you of verses that you've memorized, maybe even in Awana. It reminds you of verses, I mean, not verses, but um, worship songs that you've heard on the radio that, you know, when you feel down and you feel sad and you hear, you know, it reminds you of a song like, oh, Oh yes, God is with me no matter what, right? So that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's God's helper with you. And so um, now what, right? You've, you've chosen to accept Jesus. You've chosen to, to be baptized. And now you're supposed to live this new life for Christ, right? I mean, here God loves us so much. He gave us this, this free gift of salvation, of, of being forgiven from our sins and, and being able to have that forever friendship with God. It'd be really silly to waste it, right? So I want you to imagine this. Imagine that I give you a brand new iPhone. Yeah. It'd be really silly if you got this iPhone and you're like, awesome. Thanks, Miss Conti. And you run off and you just leave the phone. Yeah, really silly, right? You would like be on this phone like 24 seven. You'd, I'm gonna download my favorite apps. I'm gonna put a picture on there. I'm gonna take some selfies. I'm gonna, you're gonna be on that phone and you're gonna be using it, right? Cause it was a free gift. So why would we do something different with God's love for us? Why would we do something different with, with what Jesus did on the cross for us? Here's this gift of salvation that he gave you. And so now we need to open up God's word. We need to, we need to build that relationship that God wants for us to have with him, right? So when you have a friend, you spend time with them, you spend time hanging out with them, you get to know them, you get to find out what they like, what they don't like. And so we do the same thing with God. We spend time with him by reading the word of God that he's given to us. Remember I said that's like a letter that he gave to us. That's like a, a manual that he gave to us so we know how to live in this life that he created us. So if he created us, he knows what's best for us. So we spend time with God. We get to know him more and we get to know ourselves more because we're created in God's image. And so we get to know 
why God created us and what our purpose is for. So we spend time with him reading his word, we memorize God's word, that way the Holy Spirit can remind us of what we read and what we memorized. We spend time in prayer, you know, prayers when we talk to God and we get to tell him, you know, hey God, I'm so thankful for what you've done for us or hey, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in this area, I need your help, I'm worried, you know, and that's our way of talking to God. And when, um, and when you spend more time in God's word, you're going to be able to, to know when the Holy Spirit is talking to you, right? Like think about a friend. Let's say you have a friend who, who moved away. And when, they, when your friend moved away, you were so good about talking to your friend like every single day after school, right? So, hey, what's up? What's going on? But then time passes and you begin to maybe talk to your friend like once a month. I'm sorry, like once a week, and then it turns into once a month, and then it turns into like every few months, and then next thing you know, it's been a year, and you haven't talked to your friend, and one day your friend like calls you on the phone, and they're like, hey, Miss Conti, what's up? But you haven't talked to this friend in so long, you don't even recognize their voice. You're like, wait, who's this? So if we wanna know God's voice, if we wanna know how he's leading us and how the Holy Spirit is leading us, then we need to be in his word so that way we know that that's, a, that, that's God and not, not, not something wrong that we wanna do on our own, okay? So yeah, after you accept Christ and after you've been baptized, you spend time with him in his word, you pray with him, you come to church so you can spend time with other people who believe the same thing and you can be encouraged by one another. You know, you have teachers like myself and you have your small group leaders and you have other people who wanna help you and help you understand God's word because sometimes it's really hard. And so we're here to help you understand God's word. And then another really amazing part of, of coming to church is we can take communion together. You know, when we're with other people who believe the same thing that we do, whether we're at church or whether, you know, we're with other believers, we get to take part in communion. And communion is a reminder of God's sacrifice that he made for us. When Jesus was with his disciples the night before he passed away, he actually like explained to them what communion was, although they didn't know it at the time. We get to understand that now because you know we're years and years later. So Jesus actually told his disciples to take a piece of bread that will remind them of the body that he was going to give up for them on the cross and then take some juice and that was going to remind them of the blood that he was gonna give up for them on the cross. And again, they didn't understand that, but we understand that now. So we take, we take the communion, the bread, the cracker and the juice, and that reminds us of God's amazing love of the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And we are reminded that he did that in order for us to have that relationship with God. And we should remember that every day, like that should be something we remember every day, but this is a special time for us to do it with other believers that believe the same thing. And so this is all, you know, these are all the things that, that, that it looks like for us to have this life that God wants us to live. You know, that's why Jesus is important. That's why, you know, God loved us so much. He sent his son into the world. He is part of God's plan. And when we know what Jesus did for us, we accept him. You know, we, we say, yes, we want you to lead us. You want, we want you to guide us and we want to be baptized and commit our life to you, to God. And so, Boys and girls, you know, I really hope that this has been able to help you understand what it means to be saved, you know, why God sent his son into the world and, and why we commit our life through baptism. And parents, I have enjoyed, you know, teaching this with you guys. In your little book, you'll see a page at the very end. You know, it's it's a letter that there's a page for, for your child to write a letter when they decide to accept Christ. They could write it out and kind of explain it. And that helps you see kind of where their heart and their mind is at. And then there's another page that says um, it's a letter for you to write to your child you know just saying you know you're proud of them for this this decision or whatever it is you want to write to your child and um, at whatever age your child does decide to accept Christ it's always great you know year after year to remember that day of, of baptism of celebration of salvation and it's kind of like a spiritual birthday now you know so you have your normal birthday and you have your spiritual birthday and so at whatever age you know it, it you do decide to make that decision it's great to remember each year how much you know you've grown from the last year and how you continue to follow God with your life because you made that decision you made that commitment so 
hopefully these tools and these resources are going to help you to have those conversations. And um, as soon as your child is ready to, to make that decision for Christ and to be baptized into, into salvation, then go ahead and just email me and we can set up a time to, to do a baptism. And I really look forward to celebrating with you and your child whenever that time comes. Thanks guys for joining.